Good afternoon. Um, I'm Naomi Rao. I'm a judge on the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. Want to th thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here at this last panel, um, just before Justice Gorsuch delivers the closing lecture. As always, the Federal Society has put together a great conference, and I hope you can all join me in thanking the organizers who have worked so hard to, to make this another great convention. So this panel is going to focus on the relationship between originalism and precedent. This is a very important and pressing question for originalists at a time when many Supreme Court precedents and perhaps even the structure of our government are arguably inconsistent with the original meaning of the Constitution. So what's a good originalist to do when original meaning conflicts with precedent? And today we have a wonderful all-star panel who have studied and written about this question from different perspectives. I certainly recommend to you their articles on this subject. I, I found them very interesting. And they're gonna to seek to provide some different perspectives considering the principled and practical interrelationship between originalism and stare decisis. So our speakers have their full bios in your material, so I'm not going to go through all of that, but I just wanna introduce them in briefly in the order in which they'll be speaking. So to my right, we have Professor Michael Stokes Paulson, who is the Distinguished University Chair and Professor of Law at St. Thomas School of Law in Minneapolis. Next, we have Professor Larry Solom of Georgetown University Law Center, where he's the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Law. And then we have Professor Tara Lee Grove, who is at William & Mary Law School, where she is the Mills E. Godwin Jr. Professor of Law and Cabell Research Professor. And finally, Professor Bernadette Myler of Cornell Law School, where she is the Carl and Sheila Spaeth Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Research and Intellectual Life. So our format of this panel will be pretty familiar. Each of our four panelists will give a brief introductory statement. Um, that will be followed by a moderated discussion, and then I'll be sure to leave time for your questions. With that, we're gonna start with Professor Paulson. <clears throat> Thank you, Naomi, or I should say your honor, but I knew Naomi when she was a visiting professor at University of Minnesota Law School, when she was just a young pup, so I, thank you, Naomi. It is an honor and a privilege to be here. This panel is devoted to originalism and precedent, and I've given my remarks the title of an originalist theory of precedent in eight minutes, and the somewhat even more cheeky subtitle, The Pernicious Doctrine of Stare Decisis. My proposition is simply this. If the proper task of constitutional interpretation is ascertaining and faithfully applying the document's original meaning, precedent can have only a limited role. It can inform, guide, and persuade. It can provide valuable information to subsequent interpreters. It can give you the benefit of prior thinking and prior analysis. It can provide a starting point or even a baseline for justification. A system of precedent is valuable for all of these purposes. But from an originalist perspective, precedent cannot properly dictate a decision contrary to the meaning of the Constitution's words. In short, precedent can advise the interpreter, but it cannot revise the document. The Constitution is supreme. Judicial decisions misinterpreting it are not. If the Constitution says one thing and judicial precedent interpreting it says something else, it is the Constitution that must prevail. Judicial decisions cannot amend the Constitution or change its meaning. Put differently and somewhat more dramatically, stare decisis is inconsistent with originalism. Whatever it is that makes originalism right in principle makes deliberate adherence to non-originalist precedents wrong in principle. Now, I say this as a committed originalist. If you are an originalist, if you believe that the proper mode of constitutional interpretation is to seek to ascertain and faithfully apply the objective original public meaning of the words of the document, then a doctrine of stare decisis understood as deliberately adhering to non-originalist precedents, precedents you would otherwise be fully persuaded are wrong, is flatly inconsistent with your originalist theory as an interpretive method. 
It follows that if you are a good, faithful originalist, you should reject, discard, abandon stare decisis completely. Stare decisis, taken seriously, is a corruption of originalism. The doctrine of stare decisis should be repudiated entirely in the area of constitutional law. Now, this conclusion, I submit, follows from a clear-eyed understanding of what originalism is and from a clear-eyed understanding of what stare decisis is and does. In my remarks today, or the time remaining, I'll make three broad points. First, I will define originalism and define stare decisis and contrast stare decisis with what I think is a proper originalist theory of the role of precedent in constitutional adjudication. Second, I will set forth the simple, and probably by now familiar to many Federalist Society types, argument why stare decisis, understood in this strong sense of deliberate adherence to erroneous precedent, is not only a bad idea, but it is affirmatively unconstitutional. Third and finally, if time permits, I will briefly sketch the dramatic and in some ways radical sounding implications of this argument. Though it sounds radical, I actually think that most of these implications are entirely correct. So I'd like to start off by first defining originalism and then defining stare decisis. By originalism, I mean, and most original meaning textualists mean, the set of interpretive principles that holds that the task of constitutional interpretation is to accurately ascertain and then faithfully apply as law the objective, original public meaning of the words and phrases of the Constitution as a written legal instrument. That is, the meaning that the words and phrases would have had to a reasonably informed speaker and reader of the English language at the time and in the political context in which these texts were adopted. Attending to things like the structure and architecture and logic of the document as a whole and any inferences that can be fairly derived therefrom, and accounting for any specialized usages or terms of art and taking into consideration background norms that may inform understanding of the Constitution's provision and so as to avoid anachronistic interpretation. Originalism posits that where that inquiry supplies a rule of law, you apply that rule of law. That is basically the principle of Marbury versus Madison. When the Constitution prescribes a rule, you are bound to follow it to the exclusion of everything else. Where the, that inquiry establishes a general principle, government actions that are within the scope of that principle are constitutional, and government actions that are without the scope of that principle are unconstitutional, and where the text supplies no controlling rule or principle, in other words, the text is indeterminate or has a range of meaning, the decision defaults to some other source of law, typically the law of made by representative institutions of government. So that's what originalism is in a nutshell, is decision in accordance with the objective original public meaning of the words and the fair inferences that can be drawn therefrom. Stare decisis is in conflict of it. What is the essence of the doctrine of stare decisis as opposed to a system of mere consideration of precedent? What gives it any independent force? I submit that the essence of the doctrine of stare decisis, as distinguished from just following precedent, is adhering to a prior decision simply because it is a prior decision, even if it is wrong. And this is reflected in the Supreme Court's understanding of stare decisis, too. In the famous or infamous case of Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the Supreme Court refers to adhering to Roe versus Wade, whether or not mistaken. That is really the essence of the doctrine, is that you ignore the merits of the underlying dis uh, constitutional issue. The doctrine of stare decisis, really, if you think about it, only has bite if a court would otherwise decide a question differently. You don't need a doctrine of stare decisis to justify adhering to decisions you think are right. You adhere to them because you think are right. In those circumstances, the invocation of precedent is merely a make weight or a cover for what the judge is doing anyway. Now, what I'm talking about is the idea of stare decisis when you are deliberately adhering to a decision you would otherwise conclude on other interpretive principles is just plain objectively wrong. That's the doctrine that I'm attacking. Now, that doesn't mean that a good originalist ignores precedent entirely. As I said before, precedent can inform, guide, and persuade. It is proper to have a demeanor of interpretive humility that doesn't necessarily assume that your interpretations are correct. 
that looks to precedent and what the valuable thinking is of other interpreters and provides valuable information about it. But when a judge is fully persuaded after careful and thoughtful investigation that the prior precedent or line of precedence is wrong, the judge should not follow it. So I contrast that information function of precedent with what I would call a disposition function of precedent, which basically says not that you are benefiting from prior thinking, but that you stop thinking at all and just apply the decision whether or not you think it is mistaken. For originalists, there is a crisp divide between consideration of precedent as an aid to faithful originalist interpretation, which is always proper, and a doctrine of stare decisis that would counsel or dictate adherence to erroneous precedents, which I submit is never proper. And that leads me to my second broad point, that understood in this sense, stare decisis is incompatible with originalism. The fundamental premise of originalism is that the original objective meaning of the Constitution and nothing else is controlling. The fundamental premise of stare decisis is that something else is controlling, that precedent contrary to original meaning may sometimes, to some extent, be controlling notwithstanding the correct interpretation of the Constitution as an original matter. The premises of originalism and the premises of stare decisis are hopelessly at war with each other, and there can be but one winner. Star if originalism is the correct method of constitutional interpretation, stare decisis is unconstitutional. Simply put, if the Constitution says one thing and a judicial precedent interpreting it says something else entirely or to the contrary, a faithful interpreter must go with the Constitution and not the faithless departure from it. The Supremacy Clause says so. It says that the Constitution is the supreme law of land, not Supreme Court decisions misinterpreting it. The obligation of the oath in Article VI of the Constitution says so too. Judges swear an oath to support the Constitution, not the Supreme Court's faithless departures from it. And the logical argument from the syllogism of Marbury versus Madison, a worthy precedent if ever there were one, uh, supports exactly the same reasoning. The logic of the argument for judicial review is simply this. The Constitution trumps any action of government inconsistent with it. If the Constitution says one thing and a statute of Congress says something else entirely, the Constitution prevails and the court must give effect to the Constitution and not to the faithless departure from it by a mere subordinate agency of government. The exact same logic applies to the argument for not following precedents that are contrary to the Constitution. If the Constitution says one thing, and a precedent decision says something in conflict with it, the faithful constitutional interpreter must follow the Constitution and not the faithless departure from it. Now, all this that I've said is not original or particularly creative. It should be very familiar to good Federalist Society aficionados. It is the position adopted almost verbatim by Justice Thomas in his concurrence last June in Gamble versus United States. But I'd like to conclude by just pointing out some of the dramatic implications of this. It does have major implications for proper originalist adjudication. If the Constitution must always prevail as against faithless departures from it, Roe versus Wade, for example, a decision utterly irreconcilable with original meaning should and must be overruled. And no matter how many times the Supreme Court has reaffirmed it, it the decision must nonetheless be overruled. Indeed, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the 1992 Supreme Court decision affirming Roe, not on the basis that the justices thought it was correct, but almost exclusively on the basis of the doctrine of stare decisis, is probably the most wrong and most dishonorable decision of the Supreme Court of all time. Thank you. <laughs>
thank you, Judge Rao. Uh, thank you to the Federalist Society for inviting me. It's been uh, a marvelous event. I'm going to go straight to my remarks. Um, so I agree with Michael Paulson. Um, and if we take what he says as a theory of originalism in a first best world, a world in which uh, the Supreme Court has a majority or perhaps all originalists, a, a world in which the Court of Appeals are dominated by originalists. But that is not the world we live in. So my first point is that we live in a second best world. We live in a world in which no federal appellate court has an originalist majority. Uh, in which the United States Supreme Court does not have an originalist majority. There may be some state Supreme Courts that do have an originalist majority, and then state constitutional interpretation might be different in those states. Second, the second best world imposes constraints. If you're an originalist judge and the circuit on which you sit has a non-originalist majority, and most panels on which you sit have non-originalist majorities, then uh, <coughs> adherence uh, to Professor Paulson's principle would create some very serious practical problems. For instance, you would almost never be able to join a majority opinion. Every opinion you wrote would be, almost every opinion you wrote, would be a concurrence or a dissent. And that might not go down well with your colleagues who have work to do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Professor Paulson's theory uh, has the implication that even vertical stare decisis is not binding on the Court of Appeals or on district court judges or on officials in the executive branch or on Congress. So in a non-originalist world, uh, we would have significant practical problems. Three, precedent. So how should originalists view precedent? I think here it is very important for originalists to resist the debasement of the doctrine of stare decisis that has characterized contemporary jurisprudence. Originalists need to take a second look at the doctrine itself. So the classical approach to precedent, to the doctrine of stare decisis, limits the holding of a case to the ratio decedendi. The ratio decedendi of a, of a case is the legal norm that is logically implied by the reasons that are necessary to the decision on the facts and the issues that were put into play either by the parties or by the judges in the case. So in many cases, the Supreme Court announces holdings, courts of appeal announce holdings uh, that go far beyond uh, the actual binding effect of the case according to the best theory of stare decisis. And that means that stare decisis leaves more room for originalism than many judges believe. Four, a principled approach. <clears throat> Treating the relationship between originalism and precedent as discretionary is a very bad idea for originalism for two reasons. The first reason is this. If originalist judges sometimes respect precedent and other times go with original meaning, but they have no principled basis for deciding when they do one of these things as opposed to the other. They open originalism up to the criticism that it is unprincipled and that it is inconsistent with the rule of law. And that delegitimates originalism. It reduces the chance of originalism to win the day in the end. And of course, it results in internal inconsistency. 
results in judges doing things in one case that they would not do in the other. So we need a principled approach to the doctrine of stare decisis. So how would that play out? I'm gonna look at this number five, originalism and precedent in the Court of Appeals in a practical way. What can Court of Appeals judges do, practically speaking? So the first thing I would say <clears throat> is that when an originalist result and opinion is feasible, when you can, when there is no controlling uh, decision of the Supreme Court, and you can get your panel or your court to go for the original list approach, then you must go for it. Second, I think it is possible to build some originalism into every majority opinion that you write, even if you cannot limit your decisions to originalist grounds. So for example, I think on constitutional issues, every opinion written by an originalist judge <coughs> could say something like, we begin as we must with the constitutional text. <laughs> Three, third thing you can do, identify cases in which there is no binding precedent, right? This is very important. Look carefully at the state of the law, both circuit law and Supreme Court decisions, and identify the cases in which the original meaning is possible. Fourth thing you can do, reach the originalist result, reach the outcome that would be required by original meaning, even if the reasoning in the majority opinion will not be originalist. If the law moves towards the results required by originalism, this makes the transition to originalism more possible, less disruptive. Whereas if you don't reach originalist results, you make originalism more difficult. Fifth thing, make careful decisions about when to concur or dissent on originalist grounds. Now, these, are going to, these decisions are going to require practical judgment, right? Lots of things have to be taken into account. Here, here's just one practical factor. Determining the original meaning of some constitutional provisions takes a lot of work. If the parties have not provided briefing on this issue and the scholarship suggests to you that your clerks are going to have to spend weeks or months in the library in order to reach a sound and solid conclusion about original meaning, uh, then that may not be a case in which uh, a separate concurrence or dissent is feasible. But whatever practical considerations come into play, one consideration should be forbidden. You should not make the decision whether to follow the original meaning or precedent, to write a concurrence or to write a dissent on the basis of your own personal beliefs about what the law ought to be. Ideology, politics should be forbidden. What about originalism in the Supreme Court? It's different than in the Court of Appeals. For one thing, the Supreme Court is not bound by its own prior decisions, as are the lower federal courts. And I just want to make a comment here that the Supreme Court clause of the Constitution does not name the court. That phrase, Supreme Court, is not the name of a court. It is the function of the court to be supreme. In the Supreme Court, I think a good case can be made for two different approaches. One approach we might call principled pragmatism, and it would be very similar to 
The approach that I've suggested could be followed on the Court of Appeals, but obviously with much greater degrees of freedom because the Supreme Court is not bound in the same way as are the Courts of Appeals. The other approach we might call uncompromising originalism. Perhaps the first approach would be followed by a hypothetical justice, let's call him Neil. <laughs> and the second approach by a different hypothetical justice, let's call him Clarence. And it might well be that this approach with one justice advancing original meaning consistently and another justice engaging in principled pragmatism would best advance the cause of originalism. One final thing, inputs, inputs. Originalist judges can change the way lawyering occurs. In every oral argument, they can ask the question in constitutional cases, uh, counselor, can you explain to me how your result can be reached if we follow the original public meaning of the constitutional text? If you ask that question every time, it will change the way lawyers approach oral arguments and their briefs. You can push for institutional resources for originalism. The libraries of the circuits and district courts are not well equipped for this task now, but they could be. You can hire law clerks who have been trained in originalism. You can ask for supplemental briefing. You can change the practice of law, and if the practice of law changes, then originalism becomes more feasible. So I just end where I started which is that I agree with Michael Paulson. This is where we want to get, but it is not where we are today. Thanks very much to all the organizers for inviting me and for, to all of you for coming. Um, it's, it's been a wonderful conference thus far. So when we think about originalism and stare decisis, typically what we think about is should the Supreme Court continue to apply precedents that it believes are inconsistent with the original meaning? But as Larry Solom has just recognized, vertical stare decisis matters a lot too. And I'm gonna to talk to you about Article Three and the relationship between the Supreme Court and the inferior federal courts. And I think that actually has something to tell us about some current debates. Okay, so what does Article Three say? Article Three vests the judicial power of the United States in one Supreme Court and in such inferior federal courts as the Congress shall or may ordain and establish. Now, most scholars believe that Article Three creates a hierarchical judiciary such that lower courts are bound by Supreme Court precedent. I should note there's an important exception to that, and that is Mike Paulson, so I, I very much look forward to, to hearing his reactions to what I'm about to say. Uh, but the vast majority of scholars, originalists and non-originalists alike, believe that the original meaning of Article Three creates a hierarchical judiciary such that lower courts are bound by Supreme Court doctrine. I wanna also suggest that it creates an obligation on the part of the Supreme Court to guide its lower courts on how to enforce federal law. Okay, so how can the Supreme Court do that? Well, for much of our history, the Supreme Court had mandatory appellate jurisdiction and really could serve as a court of error. As decisions came up, it could say yay or nay to the lower federal courts on what to do. But that started to change in the late 19th century. The Supreme Court's docket was overloaded. The cases from the lower federal courts were coming up in droves. The court was deciding 400 to 500 cases per year and still had a backlog of over 1,000 cases. So the justices said to Congress, look, we, we can't do all of this stuff. And in 1891, Congress established certiorari jurisdiction, giving the Supreme Court discretionary review power over a portion of its docket. But even then, discretionary certiorari jurisdiction extended primarily to diversity cases, not federal question cases. That changed in 1925. So in the 1920s, Chief Justice William Howard Taft said to Congress, look, the one Supreme Court created by the United States Constitution cannot attend to every federal question case. It cannot be done. 
So in response, Congress gave the Supreme Court substantial discretionary review power over federal question cases. In 1925, it was very substantial, and that was extended to virtually every federal question case in 1988. What Chief Justice Taft understood in 1925 is that this would entail a substantial change in the way the Supreme Court did its work. It had to have a new way of communicating with the lower federal courts. What Chief Justice Taft said is the chief function in a court of last resort today is not to serve as a court of error. It is to clarify the law so as to provide guidance in other cases. That is, the Supreme Court should issue broad, and I will suggest rule-like doctrines, to guide the lower federal courts in what to do in all the cases the Supreme Court cannot, cannot hear on direct appeal. Okay, so how does that cash out today? I think it has a couple of really important implications. First, a number of scholars today have, have said the tiers of scrutiny, the standards of scrutiny, strict scrutiny, rational basis scrutiny, are at odds with the original understanding of the Constitution. Now, it is true that in the 19th century, federal courts did not apply these rigid tiers of scrutiny. They were developed in the mid 20th century. And what I want to suggest to you is that rigid tiers of scrutiny make a good deal of sense in our modern day judiciary, where the Supreme Court hears only a fraction of cases, because these tiers of scrutiny provide guidance to lower courts on what to do in individual cases. Second, I'm talking about very broad doctrines, but broad doctrines need not be doctrines that interfere with the majoritarian branches. They can be broad doctrines of deference, whether it is deference to Congress, state legislatures, local legislatures, or a matter of great interest today, broad doctrine, broad deference to administrative agencies. In fact, if one wants to have deference to majoritarian, to the political branches, the best way to do it is for the Supreme Court to issue broad doctrines of deference, such that the Supreme Court is saying that not only itself, but also the lower federal courts have to keep hands off on what the political branches are doing. Third, I want to give you a policy argument that it is crucially important for the Supreme Court today to issue broad rule-like doctrines in the high-profile cases that tend to be the subject of confirmation hearings for the lower federal courts. And here I want to give you a bit of history. So we all know that in Brown 1, in 1954, the Supreme Court declared that separate but equal educational facilities are inherently unequal. But the Supreme Court didn't actually issue a remedy. It heard oral, oral argument again to figure out, well, what is it going to tell the lower courts about this new declaration? In the oral arguments for Brown 2, the NAACP, per Thurgood Marshall, urged the court to issue a firm deadline for desegregation. Thurgood Marshall said, make them do it by September 1955. By the way, that would have been a couple of months. Or September 1956 at the latest. The state attorneys had a very different view. They said to the Supreme Court, no, 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 give lots of discretion to the lower federal courts. And the Attorney General for South Carolina said, that's true, that might mean that desegregation does not occur until, and I'm quoting here, perhaps 2015 or 2045. <laughs> Nonetheless, the Supreme Court issued the all deliberate speed standard, and as Thurgood Marshall predicted, it created a nightmare in the lower federal courts. Now, some certainly were out to defy Brown because some district court judges were devoted to segregation, but many just didn't know what to do with all deliberate speed. So as Professor then Professor J. Harvey Wilkinson said, quote, Brown too left federal district judges much too exposed. They had little to hide behind. The enormous discretion of the trial judge in interpreting such language as prompt and reasonable start and all deliberate speed made his personal role painfully obvious. District court judges were subjected to extraordinary pressure and it started a matter in confirmation proceedings. Now, up until this time, lower court confirmation proceedings were largely a matter of patronage. Senators would pick their buddies, presidents would, would nominate those buddies, and, and things continued on. Nobody really cared what lower court judges thought about specific constitutional issues, with just a few, few exceptions. But after Brown II, presidents and senators really started to care. Now, in the 1950s and 1960s, presidential administrations were largely favoring integration, and they wanted judges who would want to enforce Brown, but 
the largely democratic Southern state senators wanted people who would not. And hence, we had our first major, major confirmation fights. Fast forward to today. The Supreme Court has, has issued very unclear doctrines in a number of areas. Planned Parenthood v. Casey's undue burden standard is one example. The Second Amendment is another important example where the Supreme Court said there is an individual right to bear arms and has told us nothing about what that actually means. And that means that things get pushed onto lower courts and huge pressure is placed on the lower federal judiciary as senators scrutinize how those lower federal court judges are going to vote on these issues. And whatever one thinks of the substantive issues themselves, I think we can all agree that the divisive and contentious nature of lower court federal con confirmation hearings are not healthy for the Article III judiciary. So I'm just gonna close with a reference to Justice Scalia. We know that he loved rules. And in fact, Justice Scalia said that the rule of law is the law of rules. Now, I think that was a dramatic overstatement. But what I want to suggest to you is in our current judicial hierarchy, in order for the Supreme Court to maintain a meaningful supremacy over its judicial inferiors, the Supreme Court should create a law of rules. Thank you. So I want to join my co-panelists in thanking the organizers and also uh, Judge Rao for moderating this panel. My talk is going to be on originalism and stare decisis, two considerations from the common law. You may have already guessed from the trajectory of this panel so far, beginning with Michael's critique of stare decisis, then continuing with Larry and Tara, that I will suggest that originalism is not incompatible with stare decisis, so you have the full range of perspectives. Um, at least if stare decisis is conceived as flexibly as both originalists and non-originalists have done over the past several decades. Rather than making the positive case for stare decisis though, I instead want to focus on two arguments in particular against eliminating it. Um, and these arguments are derived from common law jurisprudence, the same jurisprudence from which stare decisis was originally derived. The first argument is that stare decisis protects against fundamental interpretive errors performed by one judge or a small set of judges. And the second is that there might be a quasi-democratic basis for stare decisis. Larry Solom has argued elsewhere that there is a rule of law justification for retaining stare decisis, and I want to say that there may be also democratic reasons. Well, I will look back to a 17th century English controversy between common lawyer Sir Matthew Hale, who was widely read by lawyers of the founding generation in America, and early modern philosopher Thomas Hobbes to flesh out these arguments, I think that they furnish a rationale for various explanations of stare decisis that we can find in a number of Supreme Court decisions, both of recent years and of the founding era. In late 17th century England, Sir Matthew Hale, author of The History of the Common Law and a jurist both uh, during and after the English Revolution, as well as a law reformer under Cromwell, entered into a significant controversy with Thomas Hobbes about the nature of law and legal authority. Hale followed Sir Edward Cook, who had spoken of the artificial wisdom of the common law, which derived from long accumulated precedent and custom. Hale insisted upon the significance of judicial office and the force of judge-made law as accepted by the people. And this emphasis on acceptance came partly from his, the fact that he himself lived through such tumultuous times where he was both uh, a lawyer before Charles I was beheaded, then uh, a lawyer under Crom Cromwell, and then also under the Restoration. So he had to think about justifications for retaining the law during times of tumult. Um, Hobbes argued against Hale that only the sovereign could make laws and ultimately interpret them. 
But the difficulty of Hobbes's position that only the sovereign could make laws um, became quickly evident even within his own critique of Hale. Um, addressing the worry that even though the sovereign made the laws, the wrong interpreter of the law could misunderstand it, Hobbes ultimately had to acknowledge that under his theory, the sovereign himself also had to be the final interpreter. So when the sovereign becomes the people, as in the US system, this strategy seems increasingly difficult and we require resort to the amendment process as some political theorists, including Richard Tuck, have recently argued. So this idea of general acceptance of judicial interpretations may thus suggest an alternative form of popular authorization. So I want to turn to the first point and how it plays out in recent jurisprudence. We can see how worries about error in interpretation furnishes a justification for stare decisis both in the very recent Gamble case, which was already mentioned, although it was the Thomas opinion in Gamble, not the one that I'm going to focus on, as well as the very early case of ex parte Bowman from 1807. In Gamble, as many of you already probably know, Justice Alito, writing for the majority, reaffirmed the line of Supreme Court cases holding that the double jeopardy clause permits both the federal government and the states to prosecute a defendant because they're separate sovereigns. And therefore, an offense against the federal government is not the same as an offense against the state governments. Alito's opinion relied on the idea that, quote, something more than ambiguous historical evidence is required before we will flatly overrule a number of major decisions of this court, unquote. I think if we were to follow this reasoning and also take into account the extent of legitimate contestation over original meaning, uh, an extent that we saw witnessed by the debate, uh, the fascinating debate between Michael McConnell and Philip Hamburger at lunchtime, um, it would lead us to implement a fairly strong norm of stare decisis within originalist decision making. So uh, the Gamble case is a recent example of using this method, but I think turning back the clock, Chief Justice Marshall's opinion in Ex parte Bowman, which affirmed the court's constitutional capacity to hear a writ of habeas corpus brought in the case, um, weighed two precedents heavily and gave a similar justification. So in, in weighing these precedents very heavily, he followed the argument of lawyer Robert Harper, who had urged the case for stare decisis in quite passionate terms, contending, quote, it is behind stare decisis that courts and judges love to take refuge in times and circumstances that might induce them to doubt of themselves, to dread the secret operation of their own passions and prejudices, or those external influences against which, in the imperfection of our nature, our minds can never be sufficiently guarded. In such times and circumstances, a judge will say to himself, quote, I know not how far I might be able in this case to form an impartial opinion. I know not how far my judgment may be blinded or misled by my own feelings or the views and wishes of those with whom I am connected. But here is a precedent established under circumstances which exclude all possibility of improper bias. This precedent is therefore more to be relied on than my judgment, and to this I will adhere as the best and only means of protecting myself, my own reputation, and the safety of those who are to be affected my, for, by my decision against the danger of those powerful, though imperceptible, influences. Under this account, adhering to stare decisis avoids not only factual error, or error about the true original meaning of the Constitution, but also the sometimes unconscious effects of emotional or political bias. So that first point is really about the possibility of error and the role of stare decisis in preventing uh, the persistence of error. The second point I want to make is that the acceptance of settled decisions furnishes a kind of democratic basis for retaining them. I've, I've often found implausible the idea that uh, the, of the counter-majoritarian difficulty. Um, given the implausibility that voters would hold presidents or legislators accountable for one particular decision, as opposed to the vast set of other determinations that he or she makes, um, it seems that the frequent insistence on legislative and executive decision-making as more democratic than judicial decision-making is somewhat odd. 
After all, you could have a story of democratic accountability of judges too, who are also appointed by the president, uh, a democratically elected official obviously, and confirmed by the Senate, and could potentially be removed from the office in extreme circumstances by impeachment. These considerations, which I don't have time to go into further here aside, I think that one use of the idea of reliance um, within cases appealing to stare decisis in recent years has, in fact, drawn upon the notion that established precedents acquire a kind of democratic legitimacy. A narrow view of reliance articulated by uh, Justice Roger Taney in his 1851 decision in the Propeller Genesee uh, Chief case distinguishes the kind of reliance placed upon decisions of, quote, any question of property or laying down any rule by which the right of property should be determined or disturbing the rights and properties of parties from the other such jurisdictional issues as were involved in the Genesee Chief case. And he thinks that, he thought that only the former really could be protected by stare decisis, not the broader principles. This property-based understanding of reliance does persist today but alongside it has grown another conception of societal reliance, which appeared explicitly in support of the decision in cases like Arizona against Grant, Dickerson, and Casey, which was also referred to earlier. Similarly, in Lawrence against Texas and Adirond against Pena, the court felt the need to disclaim such societal reliance upon the earlier rulings that they overturned. This variety of reliance, I think, is not only, as Larry Solom might argue, about retaining the rule of law, but also supports democratic values. Acceptance of the decisions in these cases may have indicated their democratic legitimation and also have helped to structure democratic processes in their aftermath. So those are the two points that I want to raise that I think the common law brings us in support of using stare decisis in originalist interpretation. And I want to leave enough time for our conversation. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much to everyone. Um, I guess I will take the moderator's prerogative of kicking off with a few questions. Um, so I'll start with you, Mike. Um, if that's okay. So um, I'm just wondering, how would you respond to, to Professor Solom's view that we have to account for being in a second best world? Would you agree that we're in a second best world? We, we are in a second best world, but I, I really admire his, Larry's systematic theory of how we move from a second best world to a first best world. I would like to live in a first best world. I am a purist, and I think there are ways that, uh, and some of this is very much compatible with what uh, Larry was saying, in terms of how you act as a lower court judge. We may be advising you, uh, Judge Rao, on this. Um, <clears throat> in order to be a faithful originalist in a second best world. Um, I think Justice Clarence Thomas is a good exemplar of that. I do not think he ever joins a decision that he is fully persuaded is incorrect on originalist grounds. He does not always advance his originalist arguments if they are not <coughs> briefed or prepared and if he's not ready to go. But he does not deliberately join a decision on the basis of stare decisis that he otherwise would conclude is wrong. Uh, you see that that does, in Thomas, produce some separate concurring opinions, and I think that's a good way to be, you know, that he actually does say, I reserve the question of whether we should reconsider this doctrine more fully, but in terms of the court's precedence, I do not disagree with the analysis or the conclusion reached. I think that's a good way to do it. Um, I it Just anecdotally, I've seen some excellent lower federal court judges who I believe are originalists, who feel themselves feel themselves constrained by hierarchical precedent, but nonetheless, it's hard pressed to actually find instances where they decide in a way that the originalism would conclude is wrong. Uh, a great example of this, so I haven't read every opinion Judge Frank Easterbrook has written. I've read quite a few where he seems to be able to work within existing sets of doctrines, but reach faithfully originalist results. I've never read a decision of his. I mean, there are sometimes there are contestable originalist conclusions, but I've never read one that where he is unsuccessful in conforming the doctrine to what he understands to be the correct answer. 
Thanks. Um, I think it's a sign of how many federal judges are in the audience that so many of the panelists focus on advice for federal judges. So. Um, okay, so I actually, I, I have a question maybe that for the, for the other three panelists in part relating because I think Professor Paulson's view is such a purist view. Um, you know, there are of course line drawing problems in many of the other approaches, right? If for instance, you know, we should we should think about common law principles, or if the Supreme Court should be laying down um, certain rules that other courts can follow, or if we should be moving towards a first best world, then why not just adopt Professor Paulson's approach? Does that get rid of some of the line drawing problems, some of the difficulties? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want to start? So or yeah, I mean, I think that there have always been line drawing problems in judging, and that that's actually part of the beauty of of a system where uh, people are judging, you know, in a way very similarly to how they did 500 years ago um, <coughs> under the common law. I mean, I know that I just, the late Justice Scalia uh, had a critique of that system saying that we should be more like civil law judges or we should have something more like civil law judges, um, even though uh, everyone is kind of educated into this common law system by the first year of law school. Um, but I think that this is a kind of line drawing, a set of line drawing problems that uh, judges have always had to handle and are handling in a way no differently under originalism than under other theories. And I haven't looked empirically at this, but my sense is that actually originalist judges aren't necessarily overturning precedent any more frequently than non-originalist judges. That in fact, uh, the problems of stare decisis seem fairly consistent across both originalist and non-originalist judges. Um, so that I see this as more a problem of kind of judicial method, that there are always going to be these line drawing issues um, that are going to crop up whenever we have uh, a judicial system along the Anglo-American model. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, so I, I think. Um, First of all, I wonder if, if Professor Paulson is, is quite as absolutist as, as I, always, I always take you to be in, in your writing, uh, which, is, which is wonderful writing, because you did say that a judge can have, quote, interpretive humility. Um, and if that's the case, and if as this conference itself has, has underscored, there is tremendous disagreement as to what originalism even requires in a number of different areas, um, does that notion of interpretive humility, I wonder, potentially just allow for stare decisis? Do you want to respond to that? <clears throat> well, I, <clears throat> I don't think it allows for stare decisis almost by definition, right? When I speak of interpretive humility, I think that when you approach a legal issue, you consider all the sources. You don't necessarily believe that you have, at the outset, the single best right answer, and you read the precedents, you read the decisions, you analyze the text, and you come up with a conclusion. Where, that, where you are sufficiently persuaded that the precedents are contrary to the objective original meaning of the text, uh, that is when the doctrine of stare decisis hits the road, right? That's when the rubber hits the road. It is, the whole force of the doctrine is to compel adherence to a decision you would otherwise conclude is wrong. Where you have reached the position after full consideration of all the evidence that a decision is wrong to deliberately follow the wrong decision is wrong. If you are an originalist and you have, you know, you have concluded that a dis precedent decision is contrary to the original meaning of the text. Your obligation is to follow the original meaning of the text wherever you have reached that conclusion. So, so I, I, I wouldn't say that I've retreated from my absolutist views, but just the absolutist views come into play wherever, after the full interpretive enterprise has been run, you are convinced of the incorrectness of a line of precedence. We're going to take some questions from. Well, I know, I'm going to let you. If you guys want to go to the microphones while we're hearing from Larry. So, so, so. Uh, oh, sure. Sorry. If you want. Larry. So I just want to ask one follow up to you because what if you have, say, that we imagine a Supreme Court with nine originalist justices and all of them have a different view of what the original meaning requires? What would you suggest happen in that case? I would suggest seriatim opinions. Um, I, I have no idea why that's popular. Um, 
originalism doesn't always yield ineluctable answers, right? There can be disagreements between originalists, both as to interpretive method, fine points of it, and as to the specific conclusions as to assessing the evidence. But originalism is a superior method of constitutional interpretation in that it sets the relevant, the correct uh, ground rules, the boundaries of the interpretive debate. But it's still possible that you will have differences between faithful originalists as to the correct interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas sometimes ended up on different sides of the case, weighing the originalist evidence differently. That's not surprising um, that there are differences, but there, the differences occur within a narrower range. I'm kind of speaking to the situation of what is an individual judge to do. If an individual judge has, within whatever degree of persuasiveness needed to satisfy their psychological need for repose, concluded that a decision, that this is a right answer, the judge should always adhere to what the, he or she believes is the right answer and not to the views of colleagues that he is persuaded are incorrect. So. <clears throat> There are three reasons why I disagree with Michael Paulson. So the first reason is that um, I believe that it is extremely unlikely that the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court always permits lower court judges to reach originalist results. Um, if, in fact, it's true that Frank Easterbrook always reaches originalist results, uh, then one of two things is happening. <laughs> one possibility is he's gotten extremely lucky in the cases he has drawn, and he simply has never drawn a case in which the Supreme Court's precedent it requires a non-originalist result. And the other possibility is very clever but he's not actually complying with the decisions of the Supreme Court. The Easterbrook hypothesis that, that Michael Paulson advances made the problem go away, and I don't believe that the problem uh, is not a real problem. Second, there is really a need for settlement of constitutional cases. So, if we have a system in which every uh, official who swears an oath to the Constitution is required to vote their belief about what the Constitution requires if they're a judge or to act in the way that they believe the Constitution requires if they are an executive official or a legislature, uh, that's a recipe for disaster. Uh, originalism does not, is, not a, is not a suicide pact. It's not uh, uh, a philosophy that requires us uh, to have constitutional anarchy. Uh, we do need mechanisms for settling constitutional questions. So third thing, that process of settlement uh, is only going to work if we have some standard for reversing precedent that is higher than, I think it's wrong. Uh, uh, I think it's wrong creates a legal system that is inherently unstable, given the fact that on some wide range of constitutional questions, at least in the current state of research, there is substantial disagreement about very important questions. So, <clears throat> you know, there's, the, the formula is not important, but we could say something like, uh, we will reverse a prior decision uh, that uh, reached a conclusion about original meaning only if we are convinced now that there's clear and convincing evidence that the prior decision is wrong. In other words, we defer to the past until 
not just we believe all things considers there's a greater than 50% chance that the decision is wrong, but we're convinced that the question should now be taken as settled the other way. Okay. okay. We're going to start with some questions. We'll start at the front microphone. Ma'am, sirs, my question relates directly to what you were just discussing. Um, moving out of the realm of the theoretical and into the real life, real world event, in order for the U.S. Supreme Court to overturn precedent in any way, a case has to get there first. And of course, in this room, there are plenty of Article III judges. My question is, in real <laughs> life, what would you propose that those inferior court court judges do when a matter comes along that challenges what is established in stare decisis, but originalism would say is clearly wrong. For example, you brought up the instance of Roe v. Wade. So what would you have an actual Article III district court judge do when that matter comes before him? That, <clears throat> that is a terrific question. That is actually the subject as Tara pointed out of one of my earliest law review articles that I wrote some 30 years ago, arguing that lower court judges should, to coin a phrase, underrule Roe versus Wade. I actually think that the argument against stare decisis fully applies to lower court judges in exactly the same way analytically. If the Constitution says one thing and the president of the Supreme Court says something to the contrary, the obligation of the court, of the judge in a particular case, is to follow the Constitution, not the faithless departure from it. I believe that the proper response of a lower federal court, a federal district court, is to defy Roe versus Wade and say that this is an incorrect decision. I think that as a function of the judicial hierarchy, that decision can be reversed, but I think that the proper approach of the independent Article III judge is to require the Supreme Court to, so to speak, do its own dirty work. Uh, the obligation of a lower federal court judge is to the Constitution, not to the Supreme Court's decisions that are departures from the Constitution. The notion of a Supreme Court and inferior courts does have some power, but I believe that the necessary and sufficient understanding of the word supreme in Supreme Court is that it is a court from which no appeals lie and that it is capable of reversing and exercising jurisdiction, if granted it, to, reverse and, to review and reverse decisions of lower courts. It does not turn lower court judges into potted plants or law clerks or robots. A lower court judge is not the agent or law clerk of the Supreme Court. It is an independent constitutional officer. The Supreme Court doesn't hire lower court judges, doesn't fire lower court judges. They have the power where they have jurisdiction to review and reverse them. Now, as a practical matter, this does create some disruption, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> um, uh but if you take seriously the obligation of the oath to the Constitution, that's, that's disruption that is warranted. Larry poses a question. It's a great quip. Originalism is not a suicide pact. But actually, if you have taken an oath to support the Constitution and you believe the correct mode of interpreting the Constitution is originalism, originalism is a suicide pact. You have signed on to this. And in a certain way, there is... A, there is not too much of a difference between formally underruling and what happens all the time in, in routine situations. Judges sub silentio overrule or undermine Supreme Court decisions. Okay. I think that rather than a lower court judge saying, I am going to decide incorrectly because I'm required to by my oath, I think the judge should say, I am going to decide correctly, and you can reverse me if you want. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll go to the back microphone. Thank you, Judge Rao Cameron Atkinson from Connecticut. I had a question for Professor Solom about his second best world analogy. I'm not sure if I'm necessarily understanding you correctly, but I find it somewhat slightly alarming, uh, your point about working within a doctrine to achieve a result that we believe possible. I think I would 
like to hear your thoughts on why that isn't almost akin to what living constitutionalists do in essence of making either a statue or a law what they want it to be instead of faithfully interpreting what the law is as it comes to them. So I'm not, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but if the question is um, how can we reconcile the practice of <clears throat> uh, voting in a way that is consistent with the result required by originalism, despite the fact that the opinion, either written by another judge on a lower court or an opinion you might write yourself, is not a, um, <coughs> is not a thoroughly originalist opinion. And, if, and you might actually sign on to an opinion that says very little about original meaning. Um, how, how is that consistent with originalism? So this is the problem of the second best world, is that um, it's not an option to just have everything conform to originalism right now, today. That requires that other judges uh, uh, join with you in an originalist opinion that reaches the originalist outcome. If that's not possible, that is the sense in which the world is second best. It is not possible to achieve everything originalism requires. Then uh, you can either opt out and uh, only concur and dissent in constitutional cases with the rare exception of the case where you can get an originalist uh, outcome for an originalist reason, uh, or uh, you have to compromise. So compromise, it seems to me, uh, is the only feasible choice under those circumstances. Um, I just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's interesting when we think about vertical stare decisis and the obligations of, of lower court judges. I think in, in this room, um, I think because of the situation uh, that constitutional doctrine has been in for quite some time, people envision a world in which there's a lot of living constitutionalist precedent and originalists have to figure out how to deal with it. So lower court originalist judges have to figure out how to deal with Supreme Court precedent um, and and. Larry is offering, a, Professor Solomon is offering a really powerful way for them, them to do that. But I think people, especially when you think about whether you want to keep vertical stare decisis, imagine a world in which the Supreme Court is originalist and the lower federal courts are living constitutionalists. And think about how you would like living constitutionalist lower federal court judges to treat originalist precedents by the Supreme Court. And I think if you think about that, I think many, many people who might otherwise be too keen on vertical stare decisis would like lower courts to abide by Supreme Court precedent. And also think about the extent to which the Supreme Court needs to issue doctrines that lower courts can, can actually apply, uh, because it is simply infeasible for a lower federal court judge to do whatever kind of interpretive work they're going to do on a case-by-case -case basis the way the Supreme Court can do just in terms of time. Okay, we'll go to the first microphone here. Thanks for such a terrific discussion. Uh, just two quick questions. One that I'll address to Tara is an argument I've heard about stare decisis maybe being consistent with originalism is that there are some principles baked into the Article Three judicial power that the judiciary wasn't going to be changing the law back and forth every other year so that people could order <coughs> their lives in a meaningful way um, and, and depend on, on sort of a settled rule of law. And I'm curious if if you or others have thoughts about or just reactions to, to that argument, uh, which I thought was interesting. And then one quick question for Michael. Um, and the argument you're making that I think makes sense to me is that if there seems to be precedent that is clearly inconsistent with originalist understanding, uh, then your duty as a judge is to sort of ignore that precedent and speak up, and whether that means writing separately or, or getting your panel to agree with you try to take the law in, in, in the clear originalist direction. But my question is, what if we're dealing with a situation where maybe originalism clearly uh, takes some options off the table, but it gives you a range of plausible options that are correct. Some originalists describe this as the construction zone. 
<clears throat> and I think this gets to some of what Larry was discussing earlier, but if as an originalist, maybe you think one of those options is slightly more plausible, maybe 52%, but you acknowledge that the other option is not crazy and within sort of the range of, of what is plausible based on originalist principles, is that an area where you think humility is warranted and precedent might play a stronger role? Do you want to start? Um, so I, I am persuaded by the arguments, and I, and I haven't done the historical work myself, um, so I, I put that out there, but I am persuaded by the arguments that the Article Three judicial power involved precedent, that that was actually part of it. Um, and I think that's actually something that hasn't been brought up in our panel today, and I think it's an important aspect of, of the challenge um, challenge to Professor Paulson's argument, to the extent that judicial power just entailed precedent, uh, then precedent has to be part of our system. Um, I think Professor Myler's comments very much went to that. Uh, my comments were about, well, taking that as true, how does the Supreme Court today formulate doctrines for other courts to apply? But that's based building on, a, on an assumption that precedent is part of our constitutional system. I just want to add something. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. And I think that a lot of the treatment by the Supreme Court of precedent in the early years, which is often taken as a persuasive gloss by originalists on what original meaning might have been, um, suggested the importance of precedent and of stare decisis in determining meaning. So I think that, you know, contemporaneous to the founding and right after it, you see the importance of stare decisis. I mean, I would qualify that by saying that it's not... You, it's not the same kind of stare decisis that comes up in the later 19th century. So I, I think it's a more flexible vision of precedent than we get solidified, say, in the mid-19th century, um, both in England and America. So I'm not sure that the very strong views of stare decisis are the ones that would have been originally available, but certainly uh, the importance of precedent and adhering to long-established precedent was there. Uh, let, let me address the second question. This is a recurrent debate within originalism. You know, what do you do when the meaning of a constitutional provision is uncertain, unclear, ambiguous, or indeterminate in some way? As Larry Solom puts it, what do you do when meaning runs out? Okay. I believe that the Constitution generally suggests a default rule where the Constitution does not supply a rule of that, the, that it defaults to the institutions of representative government, where you, a court cannot say that the actions of representative government are contrary to a rule or principle established in the Constitution. The Constitution's default principle is the, uh, democracy, the people choose, right? Where th so that the answer where the Constitution doesn't supply a rule is that the Constitution doesn't supply a rule and you have to look elsewhere for your rule of law. Now. This actually gets to an interesting point about Justice Thomas's concurrence in Gamble. The standard he adopts, it's a little bit different from the one Larry proposes. He says you should never adhere to a demonstrably erroneous precedent. And it's unclear whether he would say if the interpretation advanced in a prior decision is within the range of meaning of fair originalist interpretation, so you should adhere to it. Okay, and I think there's a plausible basis for, you know, that's the maximum situation of interpretive humility is where you cannot conclude that a prior decision is wrong. So I think that's a, a very valid argument. Did you want to add something? Sure. Okay, uh, we'll go to the back microphone. Uh, Clark Forsyth, Americans United for Life. I wanted to ask about where the current majority is on stare decisis. There seems to be a debate ongoing between uh, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, who has said that uh, when we're dealing with a well-settled precedent, we require a special justification beyond the claim that the precedent was merely wrongly decided, and uh, which uh, I believe has been joined in by Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Alito, uh, versus Justice Thomas, who in his Gamble dissent seemed to be saying, no, we start with whether it's wrongly decided or demonstrably erroneous. Is that an accurate description of where the majority is right now and, the, and, is, and where is that debate going? I, I think that, <clears throat> that this question is very important, but that it's a difficult question to answer because different uh, members of the court have different ideas about what precedent uh, 
uh, how you interpret a precedent, what the scope of a precedent is. So Justice Roberts obviously is very reluctant to overrule a prior decision. But in the areas where I know the law um, deeply, I believe that Justice Roberts frequently has a very, very flexible approach to understanding what a case stands for. So the difference between overruling a case openly and uh, uh, characterizing a prior decision in such a way that it does not control, um, that makes all the difference. So I, I don't think that this is easy, and I think that this problem is complicated. But I write a treatise on the doctrine of stare decisis. I have the volume in Moore's Federal Practice on stare decisis. I read a lot of stare decisis decisions. This problem is compounded by the fact that many federal judges clearly do not, I'm sorry, uh, uh, not <laughs> present company uh, except I've only been on the bench a few months, so I know. <laughs> many federal judges do not have a consistent approach to stare decisis. So in, in some cases, they adopt uh, uh, the theory that if a prior case says we hold that, then they're bound by that statement. In another case, they say, ah, oh, but there are factual differences between this case and the prior case we are not bound. And in yet another case, they might apply something approximating the traditional theory of the ratio de chidendi. So given that the practice with respect to stare decisis is radically inconsistent between judges and then even within the same judge, it's very difficult to figure out what's actually going on with respect to stare decisis. Can, can I echo Larry's point? Um, as a function of different justices and judges, not only running different interpretive theories, but running different interpretive programs as to the force of stare decisis and what actually constitutes stare decisis, there is no coherent doctrine of stare decisis. I, <clears throat> a few years ago, I wrote a snottily titled article called, Does the Supreme Court's Current Doctrine of Stare Decisis require adherence to the Supreme Court's current doctrine of stare decisis. <laughs> <laughs> and the reality is that all of the factors that are invoked are inherently manipulable. Nobody applies them the same way. And so the idea that precedent or a system of stare decisis acts as a genuine substitute constraint on judges is, I think, illusory. Uh, stare decisis is a manipulable doctrine, and various judges and justices are good at manipulating it to avoid it when they want to avoid it. I believe it just adds another layer to the analysis when the proper analysis should be what is the correct meaning of the Constitution. Yeah, I, I want to add something. I mean, I think this is a really interesting question and discussion. Um, I, I think Larry is right to say that, uh, you know, overruling is only one of a set of tools that judges use. And another one is kind of reinterpreting precedents in different ways, and then another is narrowing them or uh, cabining them for various reasons. Um, and, you know, there may be others that I'm not even including. Um, and another sort of thing that I'm interested in is the explicit discussions of stare decisis have really only emerged in the last couple of decades with great force. I think before uh, 1850, there are only a couple of uh, explicit discussions, even though the court is following precedent. Um, and I think that in cases where the court is overruling earlier cases, obviously they want to account for why that is and go through various rationales for departing from stare decisis. But I think it's interesting the cases where they discuss stare decisis extensively, where they are adhering to stare decisis and what that means. Um, and it, it seems to me that the court is becoming more self-conscious about stare decisis. I'm not sure exactly which way that cuts. Go to the front microphone. Thank you, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Dan Hind, I'm a former state trial judge uh, from Houston, Texas. And first of all, I'd like to thank the panel for some very incisive comments today. Uh, Professor Grove touched on this a few moments ago. And actually, Professor Paulson, you may have already touched on this as well. 
uh, Professor Grove mentioned uh, the problem of vertical stare decisis and what do you do when your lower courts are populated by living constitutionalists. And that kind of goes to the question I wanted to ask you is, isn't your critique of stare decisis uh, ap applicable to just about any other competing mode of interpreting the contract? In other words, couldn't living constitutionalists use your argument here to disregard originalist precedents such as Heller or other things, it, essentially what the Warren Court did when it started overruling all those prior precedents? Uh, yeah, that's a terrific question. <clears throat> I think the core problem is this. Wherever you vest interpretive power, that power can be abused or used incorrectly. I think that's true. Um, if you vest all interpretive power in the Supreme Court, uh, then that power can be abused because they have the complete interpretive power. I, I actually agree with Larry Solom's reductio ad absurdum that a consequence of my critique of stare decisis is that there are multiple constitutional interpreters, none of whom is literally bound by the views of any of the others. I believe the Constitution does not specify a single authoritative interpreter, but divides the interpretive power and divides it within the judiciary. That, can, that is not necessarily a recipe for chaos or anarchy, but it is a decentralized model of constitutional interpretive power. If you do have lower court judges who are running an incorrect interpretive program, right, living constitutionalists, there is the possibility that they will, well, the probability that they will decide incorrectly. But whatever the principle is as to the force of precedent, it's got to apply as across any interpretive methodology. Thank you. Go to the, the back microphone. Hi, Gary Lawson, Boston University School of Law. I'll address this to Larry because it comes out of his comments, but anyone should be free to take or reject it. Uh, this morning, Mike McConnell raised Blackstonian interpretation as an alternative to straight up judicial review. Surely the legislature could not have meant to abuse the rights of the citizens. So we will not interpret them as having done so absent the clearest indication. And then if the legislature says, yeah, we really mean to abuse the rights of the citizens, okay, we gotcha. <laughs> and could, 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 you, could you do that with judicial opinions? Surely the judges who swore an oath to uphold the Constitution <laughs> could not have meant to toss the document into the Potomac River and make up crap. And we will... <laughs> And we will not interpret them as doing so unless they say we're tossing the Constitution into the Potomac River and making up crap. That would at least have the virtue of honesty, and it might actually promote the project of making the court give clear guidance of whatever kind to lower courts. That, well, that okay? <laughs> uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, as always. Now, now that's some advice. <laughs> as always, brilliant. Um, I, so I'm a little worried by this idea because uh, I do think that the that sort of uh, interpreting away uh, holdings that are true holdings that are contrary to uh, uh, the original public meaning of the Constitution uh, could have serious effects on the rule of law. But uh, to the extent that it's done in good faith, that is to the extent that a Supreme Court decision genuinely permits uh, a lower court judge to reach an originalist result, I applaud that. And, to the, and, and I, what I don't, uh, what I certainly would not endorse is the idea that we have to honor the spirit of a Supreme Court uh, opinion that is living constitutionalist, uh, even in cases where the actual rule, the actual holding of the opinion, uh, does not require that result. I'm curious what you both think about that question. Um, so I, I think this is yet another reason that whenever we're, whenever we're articulating interpretive principles or rules of vertical stare decisis, we should think about the fact that not everyone is an originalist. Not everyone is going to be an originalist. And ask yourselves how much power you want lower courts to have to interpret the Supreme Court as having thrown the Constitution out. <laughs>
because that power could be used by many, many different kinds of lower court judges who have very, very different approaches to interpretive theory than I suspect many people in this room. I, I agree with what was said. Okay, great. Uh, Chris, Green. Uh, Chris Green from Ole Miss. So uh, Mike uh, Paulson's comment about law clerks uh, makes me think of this. Uh, you say lower courts aren't law clerks, but law clerks take oaths too. Uh, so imagine, <laughs> you know, imagine a case where it's a per curiam. You know, there's you can't. I mean, one thing is, well, you know, your name isn't on the opinion. Your judge's might name might not be on the opinion. Um, I take it the answer would be, well, yeah, you take an oath, but it's not your job to be writing the opinion, like literally like it, it's going out kind of under somebody else's name, at least, at least metaphorically. But you could say the same thing about the Fifth Circuit or the DC Circuit, that, well, it's just not your job to fix US Supreme Court opinions. And you could say the same thing about the US Supreme Court at time two, that sometimes it's not, unfortunately, the job of the Supreme Court at time two to fix uh, mistakes made at time one. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. So this, I, I call this the not my job defense to uh, the <laughs> accusation of infidelity to the, the Article 6 oath. Surely you should never pronounce the sentence, the Constitution requires X, if the Constitution refers to the original meaning expressed by the text, but, Sometimes it's not your job to interpret the Constitution at all. Your job is just to interpret the precedent. So what about that, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm probably influenced by the fact that I was never a judicial law clerk, and that probably accounts for some of my suspicions about judicial authority generally. Um, <clears throat> Chris, I, would, I guess my answer would be that wherever you swear an oath to support the Constitution, you have an obligation to act faithfully. The power you have might be different. In, 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 in prior writing, I've distinguished between the structure of Article Two and the structure of Article Three. Uh, it might be the same thing for a literal law clerk, too. Under Article Two, all of the executive power, for better or worse, is vested in a president of the United States who has the exclusive power uh, to enforce and direct the enforcement of the laws. I was an executive branch subordinate attorney, and I possessed exactly one, one millionth of a percent of executive power, but my decisions could always be subject to being countermanded or overruled by the deputy, attorney gen deputy assistant attorney general, by the assistant attorney general, by the deputy attorney general, by the attorney general, or the, by the president. I think the structure of Article Three is materially different as respects the decisions of lower court judges, federal judges, and, Article, and the Supreme Court. I believe that they are not subordinates in the same sense that they don't really exercise independently the judicial power. I believe lower federal court judges possess the judicial power and all of it within the scope of the jurisdiction that's given to them. While their decision can be reversed, I, I think that their obligation by their oath, where they do possess actual governmental judicial power, is to decide the case correctly. <laughs> Thank you. Other thoughts about that? I'll, I'll take yeah. it up. I mean, I think it's a really interesting question, Chris, and <clears throat> it raises for me the issue of like what's entailed in an office, which I think comes out in this recent piece by uh, Judge Sugarman and Andrew Kent and um, Ethan Lieb about um, faithful execution and Article Two. And I, in kind of thinking about and responding to that piece, I came across a lot of literature suggesting that the founders were very interested in the <coughs> delimitations of office and what constituted the appropriate kind of role in an office. So we might say that the office of law clerk is limited by the fact that they can be fired by the judge and so therefore uh, need to at least, uh, to some extent, with some dialogue, uh, implement the des desires of that judge and whatever that judge thinks is the correct interpretation of the law. And I guess I would say something similar about kind of lower court judges, that that is their office within the system and that uh, there are constraints associated with particular offices. And I would just disagree with Mike about uh, the difference between Article Two as a kind of unfettered uh, executive power and Article Three. If I, if I could just <clears throat> say one thing about Chris Green's very, um, very good question. Uh, the 
it's not my job principle illustrates something very deep and important about law. So in the <coughs> constitutional context, we can distinguish between first order questions. What does the Constitution mean? What is the meaning of the Dormant Commerce Clause? Oops, there was no Dormant Commerce Clause. What is the meaning of the Commerce Clause? What is the meaning of the phrase judicial power? These are first order questions. And then there are second order questions. These are questions about how we decide the first order questions. That is, who gets to make authoritative judgments about the meaning of the Commerce Clause, the meaning of uh, uh, the judicial power? The rule of law depends on the idea that it is possible to settle first order questions by having second order mechanisms, mechanisms that allocate institutional responsibility. And this is why decentralization, right, the idea that everyone gets to make their own constitutional decisions is fundamentally at odds with the rule of law and constitutional order. I will just say if we start going down that road, I hope that all lower federal court judges interpret Article Three the way that I do and think that supreme and inferior really do establish a hierarchical relationship and that all law clerks view it as their constitutional obligation to do precisely what their Article Three judges tell them to do. <laughs> OK. Um, well, to pick my law clerks carefully. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so any other final thoughts? We're pretty much nearing the end. Okay, well, um, there seems to be music and large crowds waiting outside uh, for Justice Gorsuch. So thank you. Please join me in uh, thanking our wonderful panel.